It was a cigar Bible study. Yeah, I was invited, hey, there's got a bunch of guys that gather and they meet in this little place and they light up some cigars and there might be Cabernet there and some guys might bring whiskey, but we study the Bible, would you like to come? And I thought to myself, well, that'll get you kicked out of most churches. So, of course, I went. <laughs> right? So, I go to this place, and it's interesting. I'm like, what the heck is really going on in this little you know, place? So, I go back there, and it's interesting because it's, it's an amalgamation of about 20 guys sitting in this garage. And uh, they are um, cigar shop owners, and they work for the casino, and they are beer distributors. And let's just say they are not traditional church deacon occupations. And they're sitting in there like, well, we study in the Bible here, and I, know I lay low that I'm a pastor. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm just going to lay low and listen to what really goes on in here. And these guys go for three hours, half Christians, half not, a couple of Jewish fellows, seriously digging through the Scripture for three hours and to go through many, many different questions. And one of the things they really wrestled with near the end was water baptism. And they spent some serious time talking about what it meant and why do it, why not do it. And great issues came up. What if I was baptized in the Mormon church? Is that good enough? How about if my parents baptized me when I was a baby? Well, I, I got baptized so that I could marry my wife in the Catholic church. I mean, these discussions weren't the meaning, purpose of baptism. Why should I bother to get wet? Is full dunking meaningful or just a sprinkle okay? Or, hey, I'm not just going to go along with the crowd just because the crowd makes me want to do it. I don't see any meaning in that. And on and on it went. It was interesting because I didn't expect quite so much depth of passion and pursuit of what does God really want in that particular environment. And it challenged me a little bit. And it really challenged me because I took it as a sign from God. Because we're uh, studying through the Gospel of Mark, getting started here. And of course, the Second sermon I was going to do in this series is on Jesus' baptism. I have some intense things to say about it. And so I was actually going to skip it because I thought, we're just getting the church off the ground. Don't get too intense, Rob, right? Just lay low. Skip this passage. Go to something a little easier to preach on. And that's what I was going to do And thinking about that. So I took it as a sign from God that if a bunch of cigar-sucking, whiskey-sipping, wine-drinking guys can sit in a smoke-filled garage on a back alley in a rough neighborhood and talk about baptism, then I could sure talk about it in church. <laughs> right, so I get yeah. So that's, uh, so it's a buckle up because I have some things to say that um, how God has changed my views and where I'm at in this. So let's talk about water baptism. Um, earlier in the service, you heard Anika uh, do the scripture reading from Mark chapter one. If you got a Bible, turn to Mark chapter one. If you do not, we have Bibles to supply somewhere, right? We got them out. We got the Bibles to supply somewhere. Now they're thinking about the Bibles. we got Bibles with supplies, so they're in a bin somewhere going around here. We've got those out. We can get them to you. And they're in probably one of those boxes, Bill. Um, classically, we just want to have those laying around out here. So slip up your hand. We'll get a Bible to you. Today, because i got so many verses, I'll have a few on the, on the screen. Normally, I like you to grab them, touch them, feel them, hold them in your own hands, and not be feeling like i got to do everything for you. So, but let's take a look at Mark chapter 1. It says, At the time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven uh, being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. All right, well, they're passing those Bibles. I just slipped your hand up and hold up. I'm going to just pray a second. Lord Jesus, I ask that you bring your word alive to us in our hearts, that you uh, speak to us through the power of your word and uh, through what you want to tell us about why you would incorporate this event in the Scriptures and what it means to us living so far removed from that historical event and yet so close in intimacy to your very presence right now. So may your spirit be in this house. May you be in our minds and our hearts. We ask in your name. Amen. All right, so Jesus gets baptized. Now, uh, when I went to seminary, it was kind of interesting because, you know, you talk to Christians about what does baptism mean and what's really going on here. And The actual word baptizo, which is the Greek word, we actually didn't even have an English word for it, so we just took the Greek word and slid it over and created an English word. That's how it came about. It actually literally means to dip or immerse in water. That's what the word really means. So it means to, to put underwater. That's, that's the actual meaning of the word baptized. Um, and classically, in the Christian faith, it has always been and long been a a symbolic representation of you and your old life of sin is dead and buried and you die and you are buried in the water and resurrected back up a new person now living for Jesus. Your sins 
uh, which cast you into the, the darkness, separated you from God, have been washed away. So the water has that cleansing image, and the, the burial and resurrection out of the water is the image that has always been. And you know, some time later became, well, what do you do with invalids and people who can't get in the water? And so sprinkling became okay, and, and uh, that sort of thing. But the classic historical image is to immerse in water. That's what the word actually means, and that's uh, the idea is that I'm identifying with Jesus. And there's a couple of scriptures, Matthew 28, would be one, Jesus' last thing he says before he ascends up to the Father, um, he would say in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, he would say, uh, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So the last thing Jesus tells his apostles and disciples is, go into the world now and tell everybody about what I've done and make sure that you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this identification with the Trinity, and make disciples of them, not just converts. Don't just you know, hold a big rally and who wants to come down and, you know, all right, you gave your life to, good, to Jesus, good, nice to meet you, goodbye, we're moving to the next town. But actually take the time to immerse in people's life and work with them and disciple them. That's what Jesus said. And then in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12, there's a scripture that talks about how baptism is our association with Jesus. We have been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Again, the image of you were buried and you were raised. Your old life, who you were, how you thought, how you uh, set your values, your ethics, your priorities is dead. It's gone and Jesus has put you in the ground. That's dead. What's raised up is a new person, a new creation in Jesus. Holy Spirit inside you living for God now. You're God's uh, creation and God's uh, chosen one. So that's the image. And pretty much all Christians throughout time have always said, yeah, that's what the image is. That's what it means. That's what we agree upon. But there are several areas that we don't always agree on. You know, for instance, um, you know, the Roman Catholic view would be different than most Protestant views. The Roman Catholic view of baptism is it literally washes away the original sin of Adam and Eve and any sins that you have committed. So Adam and Eve, when they fell in the Garden of Eden, they passed sin on down generation to generation to generation. And water baptism washes away the original sin. It also washes away the sins you may have committed. So for the Catholic view, if a baby dies without receiving water baptism, they die in a state of sin and can't go to heaven. So it's crucial to hurry up and baptize a baby before uh, anything uh, bad can happen so that they would automatically go to heaven because the church has washed away the sins with that. It's also a sense of which once you've been baptized, all your previous sins have washed away. So if you get baptized and you commit sins after baptism, in the Catholic view, you need to now do penance to work off the sins you commit after baptism, which is why the Emperor Constantine waited till his deathbed to get baptized. So he wouldn't have to spend any time doing penance, right? So that's the Catholic view. Now, most Protestants would say, yeah, we don't, we, there's reasons we don't buy into that, and a lot of it has to do more with what Jesus did on the cross and less with the water that touches your flesh. And, uh, and yes, there's probably some truth that there isn't a, a washing away of the original sin of Adam, but you know, babies are probably under the protection of God for a variety of different reasons. You can look up Scripture and, and realize that there's probably this grace protection of God. So Protestants would kind of reject that view and say, no, I think there's something else. Now, some Protestants say, however, it is absolutely necessary for you to go to heaven that you have to be water baptized. There are many Protestant churches that would preach that. And they they have some verses they would look at. One would be Mark 16, 16. And I think I have it up there, um, which which speaks about whoever believes uh, and will be baptized will be saved. And they would say, well, look at this verse in Mark 16, 16. You believe and baptize in order to get saved. So they would point to that verse. Now, it's true that most modern scholars say the problem you have is the last part of Mark, that little chapter 16, the, when you look at the ancient manuscripts, the last few verses that Mark 16 has are not in the earliest of the ancient manuscripts. So it's not saying it's wrong, but just saying there's some question of whether that was part of Mark's original gospel. So it's also got that section about if they drink any deadly poison or handle any snakes, that they won't hurt harm them, and that's a sign of being a Christian. And so some churches, like, they do the drinking of the arsenic and the handling of the rattlesnakes to prove that they're Christians. Um, Most Protestant churches would say, yeah, we're we're questioning whether those last few verses are authentic, but certainly we're questioning um, whether you test God with those kinds of practices. So the Mark 16, 16, eh, maybe not ready to place your entire faith on that one. 
Others, they would look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38, which uh, I think we've got the Acts 2 here. It says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And some churches would say, see, it's very clear. Be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And, of course, that's an interesting twist on in the Greek because the word for never means in Greek, the word is ice. It never means in order to be saved. So there's some argument. No, it means it's a representative. So, so Protestants will argue back and forth on this. John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. So they would look at this, and Jesus was saying, some would say, well, look, Jesus was saying, you have to have the spiritual birth, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but you also have to have the water birth as well. And they would say that that's what he meant. And they're like, well, it's not exactly what he said. What he said was something different. He talked about a birth in water, and some would say, well, maybe, they, maybe Jesus meant, because he goes on to talk about flesh, maybe he meant a woman's water breaking, like it's literally water giving birth to flesh. It's not about baptism. It's about the human body being born out of a woman. Maybe that's what he meant. And so you're talking about the flesh and the spirit. So there's also a 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, which talks about water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. So Protestants will kind of argue back and forth of, do you have to be baptized in order to get to heaven? But all Protestants will agree, it's very crucial you should be baptized. We'll argue whether or not you have to be baptized for uh, the theological term is for salvific reasons, to be saved and go to heaven. But the argument doesn't uh, stay when it talks about now, is it essential? Should you be baptized? Like, oh, yeah. Because it's interesting in the, in the church, for all ages, all times, all cultures, all languages, all civilizations, since Jesus, there's only two things Jesus told the church you must do in your worship practice. You must be water baptized, and you must take communion. You can sit in different uh, settings. You can be under a tree or in a building. You can sing different songs. You can read scriptures in different languages. You can change the order of service. He didn't, have, he didn't leave any commands for that. But the two acts of worship, he told all Christians, in all cultures, in all languages, in all points of history, you will do, is you will water baptize and you will take communion. And that would, should give us pause to say, well, Jesus took those two pretty seriously. So maybe there's stuff I should look at and I should reflect on. Most Protestants will say, baptism can't save you, because if it does, then it's a work. The work of you getting water baptized then becomes the way you're saved, and we're no, we know we're not saved by works of righteousness. But according to his mercy, that's how we receive uh, the grace of God to go to heaven. So most Protestants would say, baptism is not crucial to, be, to get to heaven, but it is an essential step, and Jesus commanded us to do it, so if we're going to obey Jesus, let's do it. That's what the, the vast majority of Protestants would say. Um, so when it comes down to, well, what does it actually mean? I get the death and the resurrection and the burial and the resurrection. I get the imagery. I understand that. But as you, know, when you start to talking to people about it, as one gentleman, he said, look, I'm not just a guy to go along with a crowd. I'll never be that kind of guy, right? And I could tell, given the garage we were sitting in, Clearly, he's not going to go along with a crowd just to fit in, right? He's going to pick a different style of Bible study in a different kind of place, doing a different kind of thing. And he says, why should I get in any kind of tub or tank or allow myself to just be, you know, have someone dunk me in water just for the sake of a symbolic act? What, what's, I mean, I believe in ritual. I like meaning. That's kind of cool. But why, what's the meaning of that? And it's interesting to listen how it kind of bounced around. And the bulk of the answers that people gave in the room who were Christians were the answers for that most of my life I also would have given. Most of my life I would have said, and this is what I was taught in seminary, and this is what I was taught in the churches I went to that were Holy Roller Pentecostal and Serious Baptist. I mean, I've been through the ringer, but I, they, most of the churches that uh, I was in would have repeated this. They would have said, it's a symbolic act of the outward commitment to the inward uh, commitment you have made. You are demonstrating to a, in a public venue the inward commitment you have made to Christ. And the inward commitment is what counts. That's what gets you to heaven. The accepting of Jesus in your life. The water baptism is just the outward symbol of that commitment. In the same way that your commitment to your spouse is your, really the power of your marriage, the ceremony you go through is just sort of sealing the deal. They would use that sort of thing. It's a symbolic representation. It's just an image. Nothing really profound or powerful happens. It's just you being obedient 
to Jesus saying to do it, and it's a symbol of what your commitment is to him. And that's kind of where it stands. So for a couple of people, it's like, well, cool, but you know, I'm not into that symbolism. I don't feel like I need to do that. And then the only other answer is, well, Jesus commanded us to, so therefore, just to obey Jesus, let's do it. When you go, well, why did Jesus command us to? We start to fall apart. We don't have an answer for that. Well, why did he command? Well, I don't know. He's Jesus. He's the Son of God. Whatever he says goes, right? I don't need to question him on that. And that would have been my answer for years and years and years as well. It's a symbolic act. doesn't mean anything. Nothing powerful happens. Nothing profound happens. But it's your demonstration to a public group of the inward commitment you made to Christ, and you do it to obey him. And then one day, I plant a church in the year 2000. And in this church plant, um, a bunch of people start coming, and I, uh, Jesus starts sending people who have been through the ringer in their life and some pretty intense things. And I would have a couple of ladies who had been through occult upbringings where they had experienced satanic ritual abuse. And uh, they had experienced some pretty horrific things and seen some horrific things to such a degree that um, in a calculated way, these cults had split their personalities and split them into different personalities intentionally. Um, the the uh, psychological word for that now is dissociative identity disorder. Uh, one woman had at one point had 66 personalities, and she had condensed down to about 12 who functioned pretty well in a group, and they referred to themselves as the system. And uh, I'm starting to do ministry with this person. I don't know much about it. I'm kind of over my head, right? And there's some spiritual stuff happening and some demonic stuff that starts to arise, and there's a couple other ladies who come to the church that have similar things, and they hear that I'm praying with this woman and I'm doing some understanding some counseling things, and so a few more arrive, and, and I realize that I'm in way over my head. So I'm starting to read books. I'm like, well, I don't know, spiritual stuff, this demonic spiritual stuff. I mean, that's for like Africa and the Caribbean and Hollywood, right? That's, a, that's, where, I go, that's, that's, where, that's where all that stuff goes down. Not in modern, simple America. That doesn't go down here, right? And, that, that's what we, and so it's sort of having that dialogue with Jesus. He'd be like, well, where'd you get that understanding? And I was like, well, um, now that you mention it, I guess I'd never really thought much about it, right? I read it in the Bible, and I see that it's there, but I kind of skip over that, thinking, well, that's for Africa and the Caribbean and Hollywood. And Jesus kind of going, well, maybe you need to rethink your views that you haven't thought about at all. So I start grabbing books, and I'm reading C. Fred Dickinson's Demon Possession to Christian. I start with the lightweight stuff, Neil Anderson's The Bondage Breaker and Victory Over the Darkness, and I'm reading um, everything I could find by uh, Warren and uh, uh, Ware, and I'm looking at... The big deal was a big, thick book about like that called The Handbook on Spiritual Warfare by Dr. Ed Murphy. I mean, I'm, I'm digging through the scholars. I'm not too interested in the guys who are out there doing the whole rodeo shows with you know, spiritual deliverance. I want the highly educated PhD guys who've been through seminary, and they're writing some heavy-duty literature, Bible-based stuff. And I'm reading, reading, and I'm stumbling across all this profound insight on the way our lives are influenced by spiritual forces that we tend to ignore. And uh, I'm dealing with stuff that's over my head. I got in a couple of situations where I actually encountered demons talking to me through one of these w women. And I'm like, okay, this is over my head. So I do a little research, and uh, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area at the time, and so I'm looking for who knows more about this than me. And not just the academic side. I don't want the academics. I want the guy in the trenches who knows what he's doing, who, who's done this kind of stuff. And uh, word gets out and I, and I'm, that I'm searching for someone Names come back to me, and this one name keeps reoccurring over and over and over. They tell me there's this guy down in San Jose. He is a giant in the terms of spiritual warfare. He's the guy that gets it done. He's the guy that angels respect and demons fear, and he is a mighty warrior for God. And people from all over the San Francisco Bay Area know that if you want to do any kind of work in deliverance, you go to this mighty warrior. And uh, so I call a guy up and make an appointment to meet him in his office down in San Jose about a 45-minute drive from where I live. So I go down there, and I, I take one of the ladies with me who um, comes from that dark past, because we're going to do some talking and see what we can find out. Go to this little old decrepit church down in San Jose. You know, his, his office is on a basement door, walk down kind of like a cellar steps, and I'm like, okay, this is not what I was expecting. Knock on the door, and the mighty warrior opens the door, and he's this little old guy, about 70, with great big ears and hearing aids. I mean, he's probably older than 70, and he's kind of hunched over. He wears a brown cardigan button-down sweater, and I think he had slippers on. Hello, come on in. I am thought, God's mighty warrior. <laughs> <laughs> Not the image I was picturing. I was thinking someone more like Thor, right? <laughs> I thought I was going to see, oh, you're going to look like Thor. It's like, no, no, it's so God, right? Complete opposite of your expectations. And uh, so I get in there, so, and we sit down, and we begin to have this long dialogue. 
And I'm sharing him the stories of what I'm encountering, and he's sharing back with me some things. And he says in the course of the dialogue, he says, I never do any kind of deliverance with someone who has not been water baptized. I'm like, well, why is it? He goes, there's something that they're missing of the power of God in their life, and it becomes just a futile effort for me to try to do something with someone who's not been water baptized. Now, I'm in a, at the time... I had just left a Willow Creek model, seeker-sensitive, seeker-driven kind of church, which was the big rodeo show to get everybody to come in, draw the crowd, so that you have this big crowd and try to figure out how to do ministry out of this crowd that's coming. So it was not uncommon in my church experience to meet people who gave their life to Jesus 10, 12, 7 years ago and never did get water baptized, just didn't bother with it because it was kind of a nuisance or just didn't need it. And I'm sitting down with this guy who says, oh, yeah, there's a complete spiritual power missing. If they're not water baptized, I just send them home. I say, I can't even help you. And then we begin dialoguing a little bit more, and he talks about and in passing, he's telling me some things, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, i got to check for some stuff, and you got to look out for the stolen baptism, and then you got to do blah, blah, blah. Whoa, 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 whoa. Stolen baptism? How do you steal a baptism? Okay, this is blowing. I'm the symbolic guy, right? I'm the guy that's been telling people for years, it's just a symbol. You get in the water, you get out, nothing magical or powerful happens. It's your obedience to Jesus. It's just a symbolic ceremonial act. And he's talking to me about stolen baptisms. I say, well, what do you mean? He says, you encounter people who've had particularly rough, difficult pasts, and oftentimes they will tell you stories of they can remember getting dressed and ready for baptism and standing in a room where they're going to be ushered out, or they can remember standing in line waiting for their turn to get in, and then all next thing they remember is being back in a changing room, drip, dripping wet, and they have no recollection of their baptism. Their mind is completely blank. The event didn't occur to them. And I said, well, what happened? He goes, well, what I have found is the demonic creatures who have access into their life through some past life, not reincarnation, but through their own past life issues, the history of their own childhood or their own practices or drug addictions or practicing with Ouija boards or playing with horoscopes or all the things he would name, um, the demons have free reign in their life. And the demon will intervene and block them from receiving the baptism and stop them from experiencing it. I'm like, okay, it's time to go home. Thanks for the conversation. Nice to meet you, sir. Yeah, good luck with your ministry, all right? That's what I'm thinking, right? I'm, get me out of here. This guy's creepy. He's weird, right? Some of you are thinking that right now. Okay, I'm out of there. So I head out, and uh, that's kind of where I'm at. But I'm wrestling with this. Okay, you are giving me this guy. This guy was noted, and he was referred to by people who were, I respected. I mean, not just wingnut crackpot preachers and leaders, but people who were really serious in their in their scholarliness, in their um, history of their studies. These are serious biblical guys. This guy was referred to me by some big heavyweights. And so I'm like, I, you know, I, I should probably respect what he says and not think that I'm a know-it-all. Maybe he knows stuff that's blowing me away. Maybe <laughs> I'm wrong. <laughs> right? Maybe I don't know as much as I think I know. And over the next several weeks with the people I was dealing with in my church who had come out of that spiritual abuse background, two of them confessed to me that they had that experience of, I remember getting ready for my baptism and changing clothes, and the next thing I knew, I was standing in a room dripping wet. I have no memory of actually entering a tank and getting baptized. And they were people who demons had spoken to me through them. So I knew, oh, you count. All right. Um, So we start praying, and I'm consulting the guy. call him up again. I say, what do you do in these cases? He goes, normally... What we do is we make sure that they get baptized and they can receive, and they receive it. So I say, let's pray. Does God want you to be rebaptized? And they said yes. So in both these cases, we got into these swimming pools and they were baptized again in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, raised back up out of the water. And I'd look in their eyes, like, "Are you there?" And they'd be like, "Yeah, I'm here. I got it this time. I got it this time." So I begin to rethink everything I've been telling people about water baptism. Because what I suddenly got to realization is this. I know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says that when we gather and worship God, the holy angels are present. Right? When a church gathers, whether it's 2 or 3 or 30 or 40 or 150 or thousands, the angels are present according to the Bible. And I'm asking myself, why would a demonic creature go to the effort and the energy to block someone from receiving a baptism? Why would that creature risk its very existence to come in to the holy people of God where the saints are gathered 
with the communion of the saints above and with the angelic presence that are there and the might and the power of the Holy Spirit that's filling the room in praise and worship, why would a demonic creature come in there and make sure it blocks someone from receiving a baptism unless something powerful happens in baptism that that demon didn't want that person to get? Why would it risk itself for a symbolic, ceremonial act? So I go back and I start rereading. Like, okay, Jesus' baptism. What can you show me about this? What, what does it say? What's going on there? So I start reading all the... And it's interesting because, you know, all four Gospels record Jesus' baptism. And something I had learned early on in my educational days is all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, they all tell stories of Jesus, but very commonly... Two will have a story where the other two left that one out. Or one will have a story the other three left out. But there's only a handful of things in the Gospels that all four writers included. And they made sure that everybody got that. And typically I was taught when all four Gospel writers mention an event or mention an, an incident that happens or mention words Jesus spoke or mention a miracle that he did, pay attention because that's a super important one. And all four Gospels record Jesus' baptism. So we've read the Mark one. Let's look at the Matthew one, which is page 718 on one of those Bibles that you have. I don't know what it is in your own Bible. But Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And Jesus goes off to the temptation in the wilderness. So that's Matthew. We've read Mark. Go to Luke. Matthew, Mark. Let's look at the Luke verse. And it's Luke chapter 3. And in Luke chapter 3, verse uh, 21, which will be page 764 in the Bibles we pass out, um, Luke chapter 3, verse 21. It starts with the same stories being told again. And it says, When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. He, and he was the son, so it was thought of Joseph. And then it goes on and gives his genealogy. And then John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Let's look at John, which is John chapter 1. And it's going to be page 789 on those brown Bibles. So in John chapter 1, again, the story is told. And in this one, it says, uh, the next day, this is verse 29. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit." I have seen it, and I testify that this is the Son of God. So in all four Gospels, they all record Jesus' baptism, and they all record the same thing. It's one of the few passages where you clearly have the Trinity all there together, separate, but all there at the same time. Jesus is in the water, the dove of the Holy Spirit is descending on him, and the voice of the Father is speaking from heaven. All three are there. you got this sense of, well, I can clearly see they're all three different, but there's all the oneness of them all is present. At Jesus' baptism, there's this let's call it this unification of the Trinity in this moment that you don't really see in the Scriptures and other places. You have verses that talk about Jesus being God, verses that talk about the Spirit being God, and verses that talk about the Spirit being Christ, and Jesus, uh, verses where Jesus says, He is, uh, you've seen me, has seen the Father, I and the Father are one. So you kind of piece it all together to see how the Trinity comes down. But in this passage, in all four Gospels, you see them all three, all there at once, different but the same. And you have the Spirit descending on Jesus. And you have the voice speaking from heaven, letting not just Jesus know, but everybody know. You have this sense of Jesus was in the water. He comes up out of the water. He's praying. That's when the Spirit descends. You have this sense that John the Baptist, as he's coming, has this prophetic word that he speaks of, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when Jesus comes and says, Hey, let me get baptized, John's immediate response is, Absolutely no way should I be baptizing you. Remember, they're cousins. 
He's like, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus' answer is, we've got to do this to fulfill the righteousness God requires. Right? And they have this little argument about it. And I've always thought it was weird because even in seminary, it's like, what's the meaning of John's baptism? For the repentance of sins. What's the problem with Jesus getting baptized? He ain't got no sins. He's perfect. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If he's got sins of his own, guess what? He's no good for you and I to die on the cross because he's dying for his own sins just like we would. He's got no sins. Why is Jesus being baptized? You know what the seminary answer is in most of the Baptist seminaries, the ones I do? The answer is, well, as an example for you to follow. And I would sit there in class and think, well, that's a stupid example. Because Jesus should, to, to actually verify that he doesn't have any sins, he should have not been baptized. Why is Jesus getting baptized? And then I start looking at the whole thing and saying, what happens at baptism that's unique? Up to now, we know Jesus at his birth. At 12 years old, there's the incident where he's left behind in Jerusalem and talks to the church um, leaders. And the key point of that whole passage is where he says to his mom and dad, did you not know I needed to be about my father's business? 12 years old is the bar mitzvah year where a boy becomes a man. And at 12 years old, Jesus is telling his parents, I'm really not yours anymore. I belong to God the Father. And you don't hear from Jesus again in the Bible until here. He lives quietly, working in a wood shop, making his craft, making tables, chairs, whatever it is he made, being a carpenter. Some think that we've mistranslated um, that word, and actually he was more of a bricklayer. So he's a, he's a, you know, he's a working class man, quietly living, until he emerges on the scene. Up to now, he has preached no sermons, done no miracles, said and done nothing profound. Since he was 12 years old and got left behind, that was the last kind of weird thing he did. The first thing Jesus does is he gets baptized. And what we see experience is the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the form of a dove. And immediately he goes out in the wilderness. He's tempted for 40 days, 40 nights out there fasting. And his ministry begins. And from that moment forward, he preaches sermons. He does miracles. He proclaims his mission, who he is and what he's going to do. So I began to relook at the whole passage and saying, that water baptism Jesus did, somehow God did something with Jesus. I don't know how and what. It's hard to explain. I know that the Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and I know the Father spoke from heaven, sort of giving his stamp of approval. This is the one. Jesus didn't earn the Christ. He didn't, like, oh, the Christ came upon him at his baptism. No, he was always the Son of God from the time he was born from the Virgin Mary, from the time he was conceived from the Virgin Mary. But Jesus argued with John to get baptized. And the only thing that you look at that really changed in his life is his ministry of power and word started to go forth from him after his baptism. So I began to look at this and I was saying, you know, all these years I've told people water baptism is just a symbol, but what if it's not? What if God does something spiritually and powerfully in a person's life? What if God gives something of his spirit in water baptism that he can't give any other way? He can't give it through prayer. He can't give it through singing. He can't give it through taking communion. He can't give it through fasting. He says that. All those things can give you great stuff. I can give you spiritual um, benefits through those things too. But there's one empowerment I give you that only comes through water baptism. And it's why I required all people of all ages and all times and all cultures and all civilizations to get water baptized. What if? And I put that together with my understanding of why would a demon go to all that trouble to risk its life to block a symbol instead of saying something powerful must happen in the life of a believer when they get water baptized so powerful that a demon would risk its, its very existence to stop you from getting it? Maybe God does something in water baptism powerful and profound on a person's life that they can't get any other way. Maybe he empowers you for ministry. Maybe there's a certain blessing of the Holy Spirit, gift of the Holy Spirit, anointing of the Holy Spirit, filling of the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, whatever words you want to use that are biblical, that he gives you in the water that he doesn't give you any other way. And so I became sacramental in my view of baptism, which means to say it's not just a symbol. God does something big. I don't know exactly what he does, but I know that's big enough that a demon would try to risk its existence to stop you from getting it. Whew, you guys need a moment, don't you? <laughs> Look at it. I told you this was going to be a test. This was the sermon. I'll oh, skip over that. There will be new people there trying to see if our church can grow. We better skip this one. And I thought, you know, the one thing, or I could lightweight it. I could dumb this down, do a first grade baptism sermon. That's just not me. I got to share what I know, right? And this is what I know. Maybe it blows you away, and maybe it's freaking you out, and maybe you're like not sure. But I would be like, let the Holy Spirit talk to you. Maybe you don't believe me. That's fine. But here's what I would say at this point is, 
if you've been water baptized, kind of maybe re-embrace that in a new, fresh fashion. And say, maybe, maybe there's an anointing and a power God wanted me to sort of unleash. I never did. If you've never been water baptized because, you know, like, it's just a silly thing. It's just, you know, you do it for the group and so what? We probably need to have a conversation and we need to host a baptism service here because I think God would say to you, oh, it's not just symbolic. I have something to give you and it's powerful. It was interesting because even that night in the cigar garage, several of the guys said they had these interesting things. One, they were talking about the emotional power of their own baptism that caught them by surprise. They're like, I came up out of the water and I had this overwhelming emotional uh, experience that I didn't know what to do with. And I'm sitting there thinking, it wasn't just emotional, it was a spiritual experience you were having, but I'm not going to say anything because I don't know this group and they don't know me, right? That's what I'm thinking. And you talk to people who've been water baptized, a lot of them will say that. Some will say, no, no nothing changed, you won't, you won't get a consistent story every time. And some will say, like, well, what if I was baptized a Mormon? And I would say, well... To be 100% honest with you, and I got some Mormon friends I love, and you know the Mormons help paint our church because they like what we're doing, but they're not Trinitarian. They don't believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three or one and one or three. They believe that there are many gods in the universe, and our God is just one of a plurality of multiple gods out there in the universe who are ruling their own world. And the Mormon men will one day get to go to heaven and create their own world and be God of that world. So they will become like God. And the Mormon women, you get to be called up out of the grave if the man wants to, and you get to be eternally pregnant, populating spirit babies for the world he's going to make. That's the theology, right? I'm not trying to belittle and and be, because I mean, I love some of these people. They help us a lot. I adore them. But theologically, I have some serious differences in my views of who the nature of God is with the classic Mormon doctrine. Um, So I would say, well, if you were baptized in a Mormon church, I would question, because when the Bible says in the name of, it doesn't mean like it's abracadabra, alakazam. It's not magic words. For the Bible, the name of means under the character and power, totally agreeing to your name was who you are, not just the moniker by which you're described. So to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit means in total agreement with their character and nature of who God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are. So for me personally, I would say, yeah, probably God would say, you need to relook at that. All right, what if you got baptized as a baby? I would say, well... If it was under the authority and power of a church that understood water baptism as being something powerful and profound, then ask Jesus what he wants you to do with that. I know many an incredible godly saint who that was their case. They were baptized as babies, and they looked at it. So I said, well, how did your church view it? And they said, well, much like the Old Testament had the covenant of circumcision, you had to circumcise your son on the eighth day, and it meant that that son comes into the group. He's part of the community of God. But that doesn't mean that that son has to, is going to be... Um, automatically, you know, a righteous Jewish man. At some point, that son would have to make his own decisions for God. And they say, well, so same way in some churches, they would say the same thing about infant baptism. You're coming into the covering in the, the, of the group, of the, of the church of God, and at some point when someone says, hey, I accept Jesus as my own Savior, now I understand what my parents did when they dedicated me or they had me baptized as a baby. They were, they were bringing me into the family of God, and now I'm 17 or 15 years old, and I've accepted Jesus for my own, and they would stand in front of the group and say, that baptism that my parents gave me, I now appropriate it as my own. It's legit, it's real, and it's mine. And they'd be like, okay, you're going to divide the church over that? You're going to split the church over that? Me, no. You know, Some guy says, I want to be rebaptized because I just didn't feel, I feel like the parents did it, but they were neither serious about their faith, and I've never been serious about mine, and I want to be baptized in, in the spirit of what God's done in my life. I'd be like, okay. Don't ask me whether you should or not. Ask the Holy Spirit. God will tell you. You don't need me to tell you. If you got baptized so that you could be married in the Catholic Church and that's all it meant, rethink it. Rethink it. Something far more powerful happened than you being able to legitimately have a wedding ceremony in a Catholic Church. Maybe that was God's way of doing something in your life that he wanted to do something more profound for you. So think it through. Pray and ask God, what do you want me to do with my experience? Rethink it and see it differently. Do you want me to... Go get rebaptized. Do you want me to do something, a public confession of accepting the baptism of my parents? What do you want me to do? And I say, I, don't ask me. Go ask the Holy Spirit. He will tell you what he wants you to do. And if he tells you, I want you to be baptized again, then you can come talk to me if you're part of our church community. If you're part of a different church community, go talk to your pastor out there. So I throw this stuff down to simply say, the Christian life is not just about moral ethics. It really isn't a list of do's and don'ts. It's not about just... Don't go to cigar Bible studies where there might be whiskey because you'll get kicked out of church. It's not about do's and don'ts. 
The Christian life is about encountering the living person of Jesus Christ through His Holy Spirit and His Word. And in that encounter is a transformation that takes place inside your heart that drives your desires of the kind of human being you want to be and the way you want to treat others and the kind of worship that you want to have and the very hungers and desires for the destinies you want to fulfill and the life you want to live and the culminating event of the kind of person that you want to go out on when it's your time to come and check out. See, the Christian life is really about your destiny. It's not a list of do's and don'ts of a moral ethic code. And God says that he wants to give us his power and his spirit participating in the finding of that destiny. And each of us in the room has our own unique one that, that can't be compared to anyone else. You have your own and your path and the journey you have and the things that God will want you to do and the person he will want you to become and the destiny he will want you to fulfill is unique to you and you alone and no one else can do it. No one else can take your place in heaven. You're not a number and if you lose your spot in line, someone else takes your number. That's not how that is. You are unique to God. And he wants us to embrace coming to him through his word, and through working with the Spirit to say, God, you're trying to unleash something in me that's bigger than a list of do's and don'ts. Show me what that is and let me feel it and experience it. Let me begin to see you at work in my life. I know that a message like this creates more questions often than it provides answers. So for the next two, maybe three Wednesday nights at 6.30, I'm going to do a class in that room right there behind this wall called Connecting to Christianity. And we'll talk about the difference between Baptists and Presbyterians and what is it we all believe and what is it we disagree on and what are some things like, hey, where did Satan come from if God's all good? How did he create the devil? Like, we'll talk about those kinds of things. And we'll just do like an hour and a half little workshop on Wednesday nights from 6.30 to probably 8 for the next three Wednesday nights. We'll announce it on our Facebook. We'll throw it on our webpage. Ben, we'll say 6.30, connecting to Christianity. Come and explore more. And if God puts something in your heart about water baptism for you, and you feel like, yeah, there's something I need to do, and you're supposed to talk to me about it, just come talk to me. I'm pretty harmless. I'm told I'm intimidating on occasion. don't know why. I'm just plain old me. But I can be, they said. But I'm actually pretty soft. I'm actually pretty soft. Um, I could just be loud at the time. <laughs> All right. I can't see because of the glare of that clock, but it looks like I've been a little long-winded today. Let's stand and let me pray over you. Lord Jesus, these people gathered to hear a word from you, not a word from me. These people came to the gathering house maybe to see what the environment was like, what the music was like, what the style was like, but none of that really matters. All that matters is that they encounter you. And in their own hearts, they knew the truth of that statement too. They came to see, really, is God in that house? That's what we all want to know. And so, for Lord, for those of us who are questing after you, for those who are standing in this room who wanted to touch you and experience you, I pray that you would awaken something in their heart and mind that's profound and powerful through this experience that they've had today in worship and word. And I pray, Lord, if there's an action step that you want any of them to follow, that you will hound them with it day and night. You will keep them up and awake at night, thinking through what it is you want them to do until they can get no rest, until they obey your word. And I ask, Lord Jesus, with all of us, that you give us the destinies that we so long for, that we so hunger for, the destinies that you and you alone know will fulfill the deepest desires of our hearts. And that you unite us with people who in their path to fulfill their own destiny stand side by side with us and collectively we achieve the kingdom work that you have for us on this earth until we can hear you say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming.